everyone. It's Mr. Hafner, and today we're going to get started with another short story in our fiction unit. This is another super famous American short story. The title of today's short story is called The Most Dangerous Game, and it's written by an author named Richard Connell. Now, it's important uh, as you read this story to understand that game can have a number of different meanings depending on how you use it. And it's going to become apparent as we get into the story just how it's been using here, used here. All right, so let's just get started with the story. Okay, so as I said, the story is called The Most Dangerous Game. And I was coming to you today, I am coming to you today for, with a jungle background. And we've got a forest jungle type background here as well because that's going to be our setting. And you know that uh, games can, are things that can be played between two or more people with a winner coming out. But we've got this leopard skin background here, which might be a little bit suggestive as well. Because when you're a hunter, the thing that you hunt, your quarry, can also be called game. And so what is meant by the title here, the most dangerous game? Is it, is it dangerous to play? Or is the animal that you hunt dangerous? And I'm not going to tell you right now, but you're going to have to figure this out as we go through the story. So if we were going to do a reader's journal, if we were together in class here, uh, I might ask you to describe what it would like to be shipwrecked. Uh, we, we've had lots of stories over the years. You know, Swiss Family Robinson, Robinson Crusoe, uh, Castaway, all kinds of stories and movies about people who get shipwrecked or plane wrecked and they have to survive. And we're always interested in the troubles they go through. Uh, we enjoy them vicariously because we don't have to suffer what they suffer. But if you landed on a desert island, Shelter and food are the first things you'd probably be looking for. Would you have a plan? Could you come up with some ways to do that? In our story, we're going to have our main character, a fellow by the name of Zanger Rainsford, and he's going to be shipwrecked on an island. And the first thing he's going to look for is shelter and food. But that's only going to be the start of his story. As you go through the story, I want you to look for uh, probably one of the most common elements in short stories. And it's this uh, element of irony. And as we've talked before, there are different kinds of, of irony. Irony in its general term is just the difference between appearance and reality in a story, but that's not very specific. Verbal irony occurs when what someone says isn't exactly what they mean. So if, if you know, someone looks at you one day, looks at that Christmas sweater that you just got and says, uh, that's a really nice sweater they probably mean you have a really nice sweater. On the other hand, if somebody looks at you and says, that's a nice sweater, they probably mean the opposite of what the words just said. When somebody says, smooth move, right, it's not a compliment. So that would be verbal irony. Look for verbal irony in this story. It happens. We have this thing called irony of situation. Our first, I'm, I'm going to get my highlighter up here because I like that highlighter. Uh, irony of situation uh, was something that we saw in our first unit when we read about Finn McCool. And we had to look at all the little things that had to happen in order for that prophecy to be fulfilled. So we have irony, we have verbal irony, we have irony of situation. We're going to look for all of those as we read The Most Dangerous Game. Plot is going to be something that we're going to study here. Plot is always important when you're reading a short story. But the most dangerous game follows the plot pyramid uh, that we're going to talk about. And you've seen it before. It's, it's nothing new. Uh, Freitag's plot pyramid uh, just kind of shows different things that happen in a story. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look for that as we go through. Uh, we're going to look for things like, is there any background information that we need to have before we get started? That would be our exposition. What actually makes the story get started? In other words, where does the conflict get introduced? That's our inciting incident. As tensions build in the story, we have rising action. We have the climax, which is the highest point of action in the story. And then there's often some falling action, but we've got to have a resolution. If at the end of the story, the conflict persists, it's not the end of the story. And so the resolution is the end of that conflict. And every once in a while, we have a story that has a, a little bit of follow-up, a little bit of something after the uh, resolution. And we call that denouement. It's a French word, and you'll see it on the screen. All right, so The Most Dangerous Game was published uh, at the height of the Jazz Age, 1924. I believe that was the same year as The Great Gatsby. Uh, it was a, a period of time when people were going to see silent movies and, and uh, electricity on, 
uh, in big cities, was starting to light up the cities at night. And this is a story of an American hunter named Zanger Rainsford uh, who gets shipwrecked on a mysterious island. He's going to meet another character uh, named General Zaroff. And what we're going to end up here with is Rainsford becomes our protagonist, Zaroff becomes our antagonist, and the conflict is going to exist uh, between those two men. But remember, that would be man versus man conflict, right? That doesn't mean it's going to be the only conflict in a story. Look for all the other types. Look for that internal conflict, that man versus himself. Uh, look for external, trying to survive in the wild, uh, being thrown into the ocean and having to get to land before you drown. Uh, look for some of those things. Look for how the characters are developed. Remember, characters can be developed not only uh, through direct attempts of just simply describing the character, but you can do things like make the characterization come through through the way they speak, the things they say, uh, the, the way they act, the way they dress, the way they move. Uh, all of that can help build the characters. Now, here is Freitag's plot pyramid that I was mentioning a little while ago. You are going to see this again and again and again in discussions about literature. First, I want to say it is not a plan for writing a story. And not every story is going to follow this format. Many do. But it's still a good tool to help us talk about some common elements of, of plot as we go through. First of all, I think it's drawn poorly because uh, I, I just mentioned all of these here as we went through, but climax is the height of the action in our story. And according to this pyramid, it looks like it happens right in the middle of the story. And, and that's ridiculous. We know that climax almost always happens much closer to the end of the story. And so instead of this coming up like this, it may be able to go and then drop off much more quickly. But I want you be, to be able to learn these terms and then talk about stories using the actual terms. All right, as you read the story, and it's a long one, it's going to take more than one day. It's probably the, the, the longest short story that we read. Uh, I want you to look for all the characters, get to know who everyone is in this story. Who's Whitney, who's Rainsford, who's Zara, who is uh, Ivan, right? What are they like? What are their descriptions? We want to, at the end of this, we want to be able to fill that Freitag's plot pyramid with descriptions of what this story did at every part of the plot. What kinds of conflict do we have? External, internal, just one kind? Do we have more than one kind? Look for the irony, especially verbal irony and irony of situation. And again, over here, these are the elements of that plot pyramid. And in this story, we have all of them. So it's a perfect story to enjoy as a story but also to uh, uh, use to practice uh, our understanding of the, uh, the plot pyramid. So again, uh, you're going to look for all of these as you go through the story. Oops, let me go back one more there. Um, plot and conflict. So when you're finished with the story, what I want you to be able to do is talk about plot and conflict as it relates to the story. Talk about the different kinds of conflict as they relate to this story. And uh, you'll be great. I know you're going to love this story. This is, this is one of the classics of all times. It's been adapted and redone as movies, as plays. Uh, it's even been, uh, if, if you know what parody is, parody is when you take a well-known piece of art or literature and you sort of poke fun at, of it. Uh, it's been done on The Simpsons. It was done on an old show called Gilligan's Island. Uh, back in the 1970s, there was this television show called Fantasy Island where people would come to this magical island and pay to have whatever their, their craziest fantasies were fulfilled. And there was one episode, and it was exactly the same as the story, The Most Dangerous Game. All right, so it's time now to go to Schoology, click the link for The Most Dangerous Game, and read the story. Take your time. You don't have to do it in one sitting. It is a long story, but I think you're going to want to keep reading. It's hard to stop this one. All right, you guys enjoy, and I'll see you next time. <music>